Great. Welcome to Crazy Horse Memorial for Bus to Base Tour. My name is Dorothy. You can call me DA. We're going to go down to the base of the monument and get off at the viewing area, take some pictures, video, whatever you like, give you some more information and come on back. Sound like a plan? Yeah. All righty. Here at Crazy Horse Memorial, we do honor all Native Americans. If you look up at the monument, you can see that tunnel that was bored through the mountain. Korchak did that work between 1967 and 1970. It was very necessary in order to get the heavy equipment from the other side of the mountain to this side. The only road going up to the top of the mountain is on the other side. Korchak said it took about two years to complete that work, working alongside his sons. And he said it was the hardest work that he had done. But if you watch that video, I would think it was going up and down the 741 steps. Huh. Yeah, that would wear me out real quick. I don't think I'd even make it up 20. If you look up at the mountain, you can see that horse's head that was painted on the side of the mountain as well. Just underneath that pointing finger hand that was just unveiled last month, just underneath that pointing finger is the horse's mane that they've already started on. And they'll be working their way down on that. They're in the carving and finishing phase of that. That horse's head is a little bit hard to see because of the slurry that's coming over the side of the mountain from them working on his wrist and hand. But the original mural was painted by Korchak. His wife Ruth was down in the par parking lot directing him with a, set, a pair of binoculars and a two-way radio. Korchak hung off the side of the mountain on a one-inch rope. He had a gallon of White House paint strapped to one side of his belt and a two-way radio on the other side. He used a three-inch house paintbrush and 176 gallons of White House paint later. He was very happy when that was completed, mostly because his wife didn't ask him to put on a second coat of paint. But he was also unhappy because most people thought that he was only going to paint the mural and not carve the whole mountain. Korchak was originally contacted by Chief Henry Standing Bear in 1939 after they read about Korchak in the newspaper. He had won first prize for his artwork in the New York World's Fair. They corresponded for about a decade before Korchak made the decision to carve the monument for the Native Americans. They had already been turned down by Gus and Borglum, and the federal government declined to carve a monument to the Native Americans. Korchak, in between that time, spent two weeks with Chief Henry Standing Bear and the Lakota Elders on Pine Ridge Reservation, about 90 miles from here. And he also volunteered to go into World War II. He was wounded twice, received a Purple Heart, and when he returned, he declined to carve war memorials for the government and had made his decision to carve the mountain for the Native Americans. If you look over to the left here, past those power lines, you see that grove of white aspen trees in the back there. Just to the right is the base of the mount mountain. And just behind that, you'll see a dark spot in the side of the base and side of the mountain that is Korchak's tomb. He bore out his own tomb in the mid 70s. There's a picture of him standing next to it. He had a sense of humor. Inside the door is a door knocker and a two way radio. We'll go over to the other side of the mountain and turn around and come back to this viewing area here. Off to the left is a rock quarry still in use by Korchak's son Mark. He provides us with a crushed rock to maintain the roads here in the complex and for everybody to take a piece of the mountain home with you. If you look further back in the rock quarry and to the left, you can see that small skid loader in front of that pile of smaller rocks. Those will all go up to, to the rock box in the covered porch for you to take a piece of the mountain home with you. They cannot use that skid loader though to uh, unload the truck up at the covered porch. So what they'll do is they'll load their truck with five to 7,000 pounds of rock. And when they get up to the covered porch, they have to unload it with a shovel and a wheelbarrow. Korchuk's son, Adam, he's 71 years old and that is still his job. <laughs> that is his heart. And he'll do that maybe two to three times a week and it keeps him in shape. So make sure you take a piece of the mountain home with you. <laughs> we have a lot of tonnage to get rid of, y'all. <laughs> If you watch that video, you'll know that we have not had any fatalities in the 75 years of carving the mountain. We did have a near miss, though. Fort Chuck's son, Casimir, was on top of the bulldozer when it went over the side of the mountain. As it went over the side, he said, 
good. He bailed and landed in the only soft spot in the mountain, but I sh sure don't know where that would be. Korchak, his father, was down below watching the whole thing unfold, and he watched his son hit the ground. He thought for sure he was either badly injured or dead. Korchak watched that bulldozer tumble over his head, and he said it landed on its tracks and it was still running. That bulldozer is over here to your right. Wow. When Korchak saw that his son was just fine, he got up and brushed himself off. He went straight from dad mode to foreman mode. He said, you got that bulldozer down here, you get it back up. <laughs> I told you Korchak had a sense of humor. Yeah. Over to the right is the only road that goes to the top of the mountain. It takes about two minutes to get from this spot up to in front of Crazy Horse's face. Unfortunately, the sun is in our eyes, but they took down the scaffolding when they unveiled the hand last month, and you can now make out the pointing finger hand's knuckles on the other three fingers on this side of the mountain. Bear in mind, it will be in the round. They will carve this side of the mountain as well, and I'll go slowly as we go around the turn here if you'd like to get a picture. But like I said, that sun is not in a great spot right now. Over here to the right is an old homestead. When Korchak arrived in 1947, he was very surprised to see that here. He had already purchased 150 acres, including Thunderhead Mountain here and the mining rights. A man and his son had heard Korchak was coming to carve the mountain, so they quickly came here, purchased mining rights, and built that home. When Korchak arrived, he sure didn't think he'd have to do a real estate deal. So he made the man a deal. He said, if you, uh, you can go ahead and you can stay in that old home, for as long as you like, but I will have to purchase the mining rights from you so I can proceed in the project of carving it for the Native Americans. It was a cordial deal. The man and his son did end up drilling some wells for Korchak, and the son work, work, worked in the Welcome Center later on in life. We're going to pull up here to the viewing area. I just ask that you stay within the orange cones and the yellow line that surrounds the viewing area. We're going to get off the bus as soon as everybody gets down from the bus. I'll give you some more information. But in the mean meantime, I'd be happy to take your picture with Crazy Horse in the background. Just give me a second to get off the bus and get that step into place. All righty. To date, they have removed about 8 million tons of rock. They still have a couple million to remove. But keep in mind that Korchak removed about 6 million of those 8 million by himself. Wow. Before they pulled the funding on Mount Rushmore in 1941 during World War II, they had only removed 440,000 tons of rock. So if you look up at Crazy Horse's face, it is 87 and a half feet tall. The faces on Mount Rushmore are 60 feet tall. So if you look at the area of his face, and where his hair will be flowing back to the left of his face down to that rock crevice all four faces of mount rushmore will fit in that area there is wow factor there for sure the last major blast with dynamite was in 2015 they don't need to use large amounts of dynamite anymore because they are in the carving and finishing phase they are within 20 feet of the actual mountain carving so as i said all they have to do is carve and finish it. Wow. I'm just wondering how far does it come down the mountain? Oh, um, almost per, almost the whole way. Yeah, I believe almost the whole way. Yes. How long did it take them to carve that? Uh, the face or all of what they've got done so far? All of what they got done. We are in our 75th anniversary. 75 years. <laughs> when, so, did they, when did they start? Uh, 1948. The first blast was on June 3rd, 1948. We had five survivors of the Battle of Little Bighorn present alongside Korchak and Chief Henry Standing Bear and Governor Mickelson. Korchak, keep in mind that Kor if you have not watched the video, it will show you the hardships that Korchak endured for the first couple of decades about. He had to wait for his work crew to get old enough to help him, which was his children at first. Yeah. <laughs> so it did take quite a while. He was a sculptor at heart. He was a very well-known sculptor when he came here to uh, carve the mountain, but he never got to even sculpt one inch. Most of his life he spent 
uh, blasting the mountain and uh, blocking it out for the next person to come along and carve it. Hmm. Caleb, uh, Caleb Jokowski, Korchak's son, he gave a presentation before, I'm sorry, Korchak's grandson, he gave a presentation before they unveiled the hand last month. And he uh, t gave some really great information. He did tear up about his grandfather not getting to actually carve anything before he passed away. Uh, but Caleb is 28 years old. He's the mountain carving director now. And he does believe he'll see it finished in his lifetime. So things are moving quicker. What used to take five years now only takes one year. Oh. Wow. Well. If you look down the power lines here, at the end, you'll see that white PVC pipe sticking straight up on that rocky hill. There's another one right behind me here. There are 13 of those that surround the monument. That is 3D imaging that they can use now. So, because of all of you, again, Caleb gave his presentation, and he said that a lot of people ask, when's it gonna be finished? And he said the only way that he can answer that is I don't know. But he did give three really great reasons, most of which we already knew about that work here. Uh, there are other reasons why they can't pinpoint the date, but the number one reason is weather. What I already mentioned about the lightning and the cold temperatures. They do work year round. They have never stopped working and they do work five days a week. <coughs> number two is donations. This is a nonprofit organization. So everybody that has paid your way through the gate, you are now part of the project now. You're the reason why that we can purchase newer equipment as we go along. You already see we still use some old equipment in the rock quarry here, and there are some older equipment up there as well. But as things proceed, we are able to invest in newer things like the 3D imaging. Any hmm. questions before I move on? Um, uh, you have any in environmentalists that give you a hard time with this? Or? Not so far, I believe. I yeah. think they had a protest once <laughs> uh, many years ago, but uh, not since then. Mm. Yeah. Do you, do you take do you take the concern about the environment in the in the blasting and the oh yes oh yes 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 yeah. they work alongside geologists as well. Mm. They want to maintain the structural integrity of the monument. Um, they also have a seismologist that monitors this, the activity from the heavy equipment on the mountain. Mm. So they do have to keep all of those things in mind. And before Korchak passed away uh, in 1982, quite suddenly, he told his family to please take things slowly, make sure it is done correctly. He was no stranger to mountain carvings. He did work alongside Guts and Borglum on Mount Rushmore in 1939 for a short time. So if you go to the Avenue of the Flags and they have the, mount, the carver's plaque with their names on it, it's in alphabetical order. You just go all the way down to Z, you'll see Korchak Tchaikovsky. But another reason why they will not take federal funding is because he witnessed what went on with Mount Rushmore. Mm -hmm. And Chief Henry Standing Bear and the Lakota elders did not want the federal government involved or state funding. So Korchak turned down $10 million twice from the federal government, and this is why it's a nonprofit. They want to make sure that it is completed. We all know what the federal government did with the treaties and promises that they made that, to the Native Americans, and they did not trust them to actually complete it. Hmm. Yes. What we have in place right now are five-year goals. In the next four years, because we're already in the second year, you're going to see uh, they're going to be working on his hair to the left and right of his face. And they're also going to continue working on his forearm. They've already completed the hand. They're working on his wrist and they'll work their way back. They're also going to expose his right and left shoulder and continue working their way down on the horse's mane. That will take place in the next four years. Hmm. Those are realistic goals and they are on track. So they're already assessing what they can realistically get done in the next five years. So make yeah. sure you come back to see the progress. Yeah. I was astounded to see how fast the hand was completed. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't quite done when we left last year and when we came back eight months later, it was completed. Mm -hmm. So it is moving a lot quicker. Mm. Any the, questions before I move on to Crazy Horse? When was the first time you saw it? Uh, three years ago, mm. yes. They've come a long way. They wow. didn't have a lot of these steps and a lot of this side of the mountain has been carved away. Wow. Yes, they do tours all the way up to the top now. Are they going to keep doing that as they, as they, you know, like in five years and ten years? Well, that? until the, the, the top of the monument is completed, once they get to a certain point. Right now, it's wider up there where the forearm is, and they are going to leave some rock on top of the hand and forearm to take heavy equipment out. 
So I'm not sure how long it will be, but once the monument is completed, it will not be conducive to people going up to the top. But if you look at the scale, the model of the complex, what it's going to look like when it's completed, that's in the covered porch by the rock box. I'll point that out on the way down. Um, you'll see that there will be hiking trails. I think much like Devil's Tower has it around it. Um, so people will be able to get closer, but they just won't be able to go on top. All righty. A lot of people ask why Crazy Horse was chosen as the subject of the monument. This is a monument to all Native Americans as well, not just to Crazy Horse. The Crazy Horse was chosen because Chief Henry Standing Bear and the Lakota elders knew about him very well. Most of us only heard about Crazy Horse from the Battle of Little Bighorn or the Battle of Greasy Grass is what the Native Americans called it. He was a very great warrior and very fierce on the battlefield. He would ride into battle with a single hawk feather on his head. So when you see that hawk feather placed on top of his head, you'll know it's completed. That's the last thing that they are going to do. It is in 11 four foot sections. It'll be 44 foot tall. He also rode into battle with a rock behind his ear. An Indian shaman had told him that that would protect his bearer, which was his horse. But I think it also protected Crazy Horse because he was never injured in any of the battles that he participated in during the Indian Wars. And that was during his whole life between 1840 and 1877. He also had a lightning bolt painted on his face and hailstones painted on his chest. He was a thunder dreamer. And that is, he had, when they would go on vision quests between boyhood and manhood, he had a vision, one of those visions was of lightning, thunder, and hail. That is why he rode into battle with those markings on him. Oh. Did he use a rifle? Yes, at some times he did. They acquired those from other Native Americans and from the military. Mm -hmm. well, will this carving have his rock behind that his That I'm not sure of. I'm not sure about the rock. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. it's obviously a thunder collector already. Right, right. Thunder it is. <laughs> Yeah. He was off the battlefield, he was a very compassionate man. He was very well known for his compassion. Even at four years old, he ran through his village and told people to come and get meat because his father had brought an elk in for his own family. And when he, they didn't have enough meat, his mother had to tell him that it's because he ran and told everybody to come and get some food. And she said, you're going to have to maintain that compassion. You're gonna to have to live up to that the rest of your life. And he did, he took those words to heart. He was very compassionate and made sure that everyone was well cared for, even the uh, elderly and the orphans. If somebody had lesser than him, he made sure they had enough hides to get through the winter and food. He was very humble. As the warriors would sit around the campfire at night, they would share stories of what they accomplished on the battlefield. But Crazy Horse would not have any of that. He didn't like sharing what he did on the battlefield. And he would go off and be humble and quiet and to himself. Reason being because he witnessed a very atrocious thing. When he was only 12 years old, he came upon a village of his own people. And the US military had been very heavy handed. A cow had wandered into their camp. The chief, um, knowing that they had already butchered the cow, they offered horses to exchange for the cow. And the owner of the cow went to the fort and told them that the Native Americans had stolen it. So the chief tried to make amends, but the military came in and they slaughtered the whole village. There was only one woman that survived, but all the other women had been brutally mutilated and he was only 12 years old when he saw that. So he was motivated to preserve his hunting uh, sources, their lands and their culture, as were all Native Americans during the Indian Wars. That's all they wanted was to preserve their culture and their lands. Crazy Horse participated in a lot of battles during the Indian Wars. And after the Battle of Little Bighorn, about 14 months afterwards, he evaded the military for that time. The only reason he went to Fort Robinson, Nebraska was because his people were starving and he wanted to get some food, some provisions from the government for them. Most of his people had been rounded up and put on reservations here. Chief Sitting Bull evaded that and took his people up to Canada so they wouldn't be put on a reservation. So when Crazy Horse rode into the fort, another one of his visions came to pass. He had the vision and only told his father that he would be betrayed by his own people and killed. So when he went into the fort, he thought he'd be fine and he was under a peace treaty. He had never actually signed a peace treaty himself and he wanted to negotiate for food. 
There was miscommunication. He bolted from the guard shack and a friend held him back. Another Native American held him back and a soldier stabbed him in the back or some say in the abdomen. But he, sta he died a few hours later. That's a very sad ending for, mm. for someone that had survived so many battles. Mm. He was only 37 years old. Wow. Wow. But he had achieved so much. Well before the Battle of Little Bighorn, he had told his people that when I return, when I die, I will return to you in stone. Here he is. <laughs> Yeah. 